Welcome back. This is the second of our uh, inserted videos on Euripides' plays uh, covered in this course. Uh, now we're going to take a look at the play called Trojan Women. This is actually the second play uh, also uh, in your syllabus, um, but we're going to cover it here because it's the second one chronolog chronologically uh, by Euripides. As you um, uh, will uh, have read or have already read, Trojan Women is probably one of the saddest, most depressing plays uh, of any of our uh, playwrights. In this play, we have an exploration of the uh, precise um, fate uh, visited upon the women and children of a defeated city in war. In this case, we have um, the city of Troy that has been defeated by Agamemnon and Menelaus and the other Greeks. Um, as you saw, so you see at the end of the play, uh, the, the uh, city, uh, remaining, remains of the citadel are set on fire uh, to collapse um, into flames. And all of the um, different um, women are going to have to go out uh, uh, in, in different directions uh, with uh, different new uh, Greek masters. So the play opens um, in a rather suspicious way uh, with um, the two gods, Athena and Poseidon. And obviously the appearance of Athena must immediately resonate with the, the Athenian audience. And once again, as we saw with the character Aegeus uh, in Medea, uh, one might, has to wonder if possibly this presentation of the representative of Athens might have been unfavorable um, from the Athenian standpoint. In any event, um, Athena approaches her uncle Poseidon uh, with an offer of reconciliation uh, since they were on opposite sides of the Trojan War. And Athena um, is gunning for the Greeks because the Greeks have uh, allowed one of their own named Ajax, this is the younger of, of two um, great heroes named Ajax, uh, to um, violate the shrine of Athena there in Troy by uh, grabbing a hold of Cassandra, one of the many daughters of Priam and Hecuba, uh, who had been a suppliant there. And so, um, as a consequence, um, Athena wants to see uh, the Greeks punished for this, and so as the Greeks sail home, Poseidon will be there already with his uh, trident to be sure that there's a nice big uh, watery storm to await the Greeks as they uh, sail at sea. And of course, Poseidon loves storms, and anything uh, that can, can be done to punish uh, the Greeks for the way they, they destroyed his favorite city of Troy, he's all ready. This is a pretty damning opening of the play uh, for the Athenians to take in. Now, this play was produced in 415 BC, and what had just happened? Uh, the Athenians, as you uh, heard in another video, um, are absolutely celebrative in 415 BC because they have uh, uh, successfully punished the island of Milos, which was in reality far weaker than they, so it wasn't exactly like this was a, an adversary really worth their time and attention. But Milos, which was supposed to be a neutral uh, island during the Peloponnesian War had been caught uh, with its figurative hand in the cookie jar. Basically, Milos um, was caught aiding the Spartans and therefore acting treacherously against the Athenians. So the Athenians move in and destroy the polis of Milos on the island. Now, here comes the publication of Trojan Women for uh, the Euripides to remind the Athenians not so gently that war has consequences for the victims of the war, especially women and children. So what's depicted in the play is that Hecuba is the abject uh, defeated queen. And she's uh, gradually hearing about uh, what's going to happen to other members of the, um, uh, the group of Trojan women, uh, one by one. And so uh, first uh, there is Cassandra, who is going to be taken off uh, to um, uh, Agamemnon's court. As we know from uh, the uh, trilogy Oresteia by Aeschylus, Cassandra will meet a very bloody end when she arrives as uh, Agamemnon's mistress. Uh, she's aware of it, but nobody can uh, assist her with this uh, because of her gift of prophecy that was uh, uh, basically foisted upon her uh, by Apollo, uh, the, the gift of prophecy that leads her to be not believed by anybody when she gives out true prophecies. So Cassandra um, already is aware that if uh, where she goes, uh, she will eventually uh, meet this bloody death. But of course, she has to submit and goes anyway. 
Thereafter, we see the, the really bitter part of the play, which has to do with Andromache, uh, the wife of Hector. Andromache and Hector had a son uh, whom Hector um, ca called Scamandrius, but was more generally known as Astyanax, which is the, the two Greek words meaning lord of the city. And uh, the Greeks have elected to kill this young boy in order to prevent their uh, any um, Avengers uh, coming around who will eventually uh, visit uh, vengeance against the Greeks. And so uh, the Greeks look really pretty cowardly uh, in this part of the play as Andromache um, uh, laments this, this really um, insensitive decision uh, by the Greeks, really a, really a horrific, heinous act of killing this innocent young boy. But that is in fact what happens, and Andromache uh, is going to uh, accompany um, Neoptolemus uh, home. Uh, Neoptolemus is the um, surviving son of Achilles, but Neoptolemus himself will eventually meet a very bloody end, and we, we, I've already seen this several years before uh, in another play of Euripides called Andromache. And Andromache ends up um, instead with a different uh, son of Priam uh, named um, Helenus, and ends up, in fact, actually with a with a, um, a relatively a successful marriage with him. And we see Helenus appear in Virgil's Aeneid when Aeneas, uh, in book three of, of, of that 12-book epic, um, visits Greece in order to get word from Helenus as to where Aeneas is supposed to go next as he journeys from Troy to found the new city of Rome uh, in Italy. So Andromache ends up turning out rather well in that sense, but not before witnessing the tragic death of her uh, son, baby son at Stynex. After um, Andromache, we then pass on uh, to the uh, final portion of the play, which is Helen. Uh, Helen comes out uh, of captivity, and she's going to be delivered back to Menelaus the king. Hecuba gives all sorts of warnings to Menelaus not to be tempted by um, Helen's beauty. Uh, we, in fact, know that uh, Menelaus didn't listen, and uh, as, as I'm sure all the Greek women, uh, uh, Trojan women there knew, because uh, Helen would, con uh, would return to uh, Sparta and continue on as queen. Um, and in fact, in the play Andromache, we see um, a Helena Menelaus' daughter Hermione show up on the scene uh, when Orestes, um, uh, king of, uh, uh, son of uh, Agamemnon, also uh, appears eventually at Sparta to eventually become king of Sparta. So it's pretty tangled. And uh, so Helen never does seem to receive an appropriate punishment for her role in uh, bringing destruction upon the city of Troy. Um, after the debate between um, uh, Hecuba and, uh, and, and Helen, a very bitter one, um, Helen is let, let off. And then eventually um, we see um, the, the body of um, Astynax uh, brought in on a shield, whereupon um, Hecuba is given the opportunity to provide proper burial for this child. And by that time, of course, Andromache has already been led away. And finally, um, the city of, of, of Troy is finally uh, reduced to a burning rubble, and all of the remaining Trojan women uh, will be led off to their uh, various fates. Hecuba was supposed to go with Odysseus. However, we know from another play of Euripides called Hecuba that Hecuba did not get, get further than Thrace, northwest of Troy, where she, in fact, uh, will lure the king of uh, Thrace in to a trap because Thrace killed he one of Hecuba's sons, Polydorus. And um, as a consequence, uh, the Thracian king is killed, and then Hecuba collapses on the tomb of her uh, deceased son, Polydorus. Uh, she starts yapping like a dog, or should we say a bitch, um, on top of the tomb, and she eventually actually metamorph metamorphosizes into a dog. And that's the conclusion of that play. So this is a pretty violent play, considering uh, how seemingly devoid of direct action there is. Uh, it is an absolutely unflinching and um, entirely condemning uh, role um, to play out uh, for what, what goes on with warfare. And it's clear that uh, there uh, were not very many examinations anywhere in tragedy on exactly what does in fact happen uh, with the women specifically, who end, uh, despite whatever role they may have had in contributing to the war at large, which is likely to be, have been minimal in most cases, since the women didn't usually participate in politics, um, certainly they come across as helpless, innocent victims by the time um, the, the war is concluded. And in this play, definitely, um, their abject state is fully played out, especially uh, in the slaughter of the um, the entirely innocent boy, uh, Astynax, 
uh, and the decision to lead all of these uh, women in different directions. One fascinating character uh, in this, to, to conclude my um, uh, account of this play, is the Greek messenger Telthibius. It's pretty clear from the way Telthibius um, uh, talks about the fates to be meted out against the Trojan women, that he is really unhappy with what has occurred. Um, he does not support the Greeks' decision, and he is really quite reluctant, especially to carry out the murder of Astyanax. But unfortunately, Telthibius is under orders, and he is, in fact, your classic soldier carrying out orders. One can imagine many different periods in history involving war, such as Vietnam, Korean War, uh, parts of World War II, uh, and many others, in, um, and, and of course more uh, recent wars as well, in which one sees somebody uh, being required to carry out uh, an act of aggression against a defeated enemy, and probably privately uh, greatly regretting it, but being forced to carry it out anyway. Okay, that concludes our, our uh, account of Trojan Women, and in our next uh, play video, we will examine Euripides' play, Electra. We'll see you then.